What do I do if it blows up? Like just fall off the ladder backwards with the sword, the hot sword in my hands? Oh man, oh, it's so bad. I might break this thing straightening this. It's not going well. It's day 14 of working on the Griffin sword and today I hope to get the blade profiled, do a little bit more surface grinding on it and then give this Griffin sword its soul by hardening and tempering it with the super cool Kevin salt heat treating oven that dad made. First thing I wanna do on the sword is get it profiled. We forged in the profile roughly, but I wanna get it a little bit closer before we harden the blade. For the most part, we have some material to remove here right around the tang, and then we've got some material to remove out here. I'm not gonna be fully profiling this right now though. I'm gonna leave the blade a little extra wide, just in case the blade warps in this direction during heat treatment, I'll have a little extra width in order to get it back to straight again. I'm gonna use my template here, and I've just moved it off center a little bit to one direction. I'm gonna scribe a line on one side, and then I'm gonna move it off center the other way. That way it'll be a little bit extra wide, at least down here. Also, I wanna point out my template is currently in half inch longer than the sword is required to be. I promised my, my customer a 38 inch blade. I've got my template about 38 and a half. I always like to go a little bit over on whatever I say, uh, especially if I run into trouble. I'll have a little extra length to work with. It's better to be a little bit long than it is to be a little bit short of what you promise. Oh. Yeah, there's, I got it bumped way over to the edge here. Oh. Now for the reveal. Dum, dum, dum. Epico. <laughs> Some faint lines. Next, I'm gonna take this blade over to the bandsaw. We're gonna cut out these chunks here. And we're gonna cut off this, uh, this little bit of extra material I have around the tip. And then we're gonna go to the grinder and grind the rest away because there's not a lot to remove through here. Something else we can check on is where the pattern for the blade and where the pattern for the tang start. Right here on this side, I can see a line right here where the mosaic, the extra mosaic that I used that was scrapped for the tang, it starts right here. And then the blade mosaic starts over here. If we flip it over, since the tiles are cut on an angle, it comes up much further. The tang mosaic comes all the way up to here. But we should be good because our blade starts about right here, so we have a little bit of wiggle room. My bandsaw blade is starting to get extremely dull. I should probably change it out, but I'm way too stingy with these things because they're like $65 a piece, so I try to get every last bit of life out of them. Ooh. Uh, probably should change the blade. But I think I can do the other cutting on this saw. This one's better for vertical stuff because you can stand there at it, the blade's skinnier. The problem is the motor's right there so you can't get into that with long stuff, but the tip should be fine. Also, it's loud. <laughs> This little vertical bandsaw is really cool. Dad built it from a Harbor Freight portable bandsaw that didn't have any kind of table or anything. He fabricated a table, mounted it to the portable saw, and then mounted the entire saw to a nice post that's bolted to the concrete. It's at the perfect height to where it's very convenient. You can stand at the saw and cut until your heart's content. That was sparking a little bit. Blade feels cool. <sighs> Felt pretty sharp. <sighs> to the grinder. To the, get to the grind, get to the grinder, get to the chopper, get to the grinder, get to the grinder. To profile this blade, I'm using a pretty worn out 36 grit belt. I never like using brand new belts to profile because it seems like kind of a waste. You're applying so much pressure into a small area that it destroys the belt very quickly. So that's why I normally go for a used belt for profiling like this. Later that same evening. Dad's finally got the salts heated up to 1,525 degrees. The oil is cooling down a little bit. We need the oil to be 100 degrees Fahrenheit. By the time the blade's heated, it should be good. It got a little too hot. The plan is we're gonna lower this down into the vent hole to get rid of condensation in the blade. 
Then we're gonna get it into the salts. Make sure the salts come back up to temperature, let it soak for a few minutes. And then uh, it's gonna be hanging on this rod right here. Dad's gonna lift up the rod. And while he does that, I'll be on the ladder and I'm gonna grab the tang with vice grips. And then I'm gonna try to get it all the way up and quenched as quick as I can into the quench tank. And it does not sound uh, very good. Whoa. Little head. Need one of those big silver suits that like iron foundry workers wear. Look like a spaceman doing heat treatment. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna have to, uh, let's, let's, do a, let's do a trial run and see if I, just see how the ladder is and the placement and stuff, okay? I gotta see if I'm gonna be able to reach all this stuff, okay? Uh, okay, one-handed. Oh, Am I high enough? Yeah. I think these are on there pretty good. Hold it up. Where are you gonna stand at? Are those burners gonna be in your way for you to be over there? You got the vent and stuff there too, though. Oh yeah, you're kind of stuck back there. Yeah, I don't, I don't like it. I'm a little worried about this like falling off back into there and splashing. Should we go ahead and vent it? Yeah. Ventilate it. Uh, all right, taking it out, right? We ready? With the blade preheated and all the condensation removed, I'm gonna slowly lower the blade down into the 1525 degree molten salts. I go nice and slow because I'm very new to working with these salts and I wanna keep an eye on everything, make sure it looks and feels good as I go. I don't put my head over the pipe with the salts in them and I try to keep my hands even away from the hole as much as possible at least. Got it? I got it. Ugh. Dude, there's an inch of tang sticking out. Only an inch. All right. That looks really good. Woo, this is terrifying. This is a lot scarier than what we were doing yesterday because I actually got to get in there and and pull this thing up and drop it down in my hand. Oh. Uh, Check my temp. I'm really looking forward to this being over. No. Oh. Is this where the ladder was before? Ah, you'd be half a step higher. <laughs> oh, we're not, we're gonna, we're gonna run out of time to temper. We'll have to finish it tomorrow, work an hour or two late, something, I don't know. Cause it's got temper for like two hours. Is that even the case with salts? Why does it need to temper so long? In the oven you do it so it's like really even, but I don't know. What do I do if it blows up? Like just, fall off the ladder backwards with the sword, the hot sword in my hands. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think that's what we want for sure. Yeah. Uh, what are you gonna do? All right, uh, yeah, uh, I guess we're ready. <laughs> Need to do this before the oil uh, gets hotter on top and cooler on the bottom. Ugh, stinking roof getting in the way here. Ugh. Ah! All right, let's do it. Wish that oil was deeper. I mean, uh, the tank was longer. <laughs> Wouldn't mind another inch or two getting in there, but it'll air harden, I guess. Okay. Well, that's done now. I got it all the way at the bottom. I'm hitting the bottom. Hopefully I haven't, I mean, hopefully I haven't uh, bent the tip or something funny. You see this thing when I took it out of the forge every time sideways, the thing would bend into a banana from its own weight. Get that cooling down, we gotta get this tempering for two stinking hours. I'm gonna keep it in the oil for a long, long time. 
We're not going to be doing any manual straightening while it's hot and oily. Woo! Yeah, how hot the oil get? I'm going to say 180. 160. What is it? Still going up. What's it at? 210, 220 thermometers maxed out. Oh, crud. I don't think that's probably good. Need, need an even bigger tank, eight inch diameter and longer. A couple inches longer would be nice. Woo wee! Uh, the board was really good and two ladders. I think that was a good idea. Give me a lot more to stand on. I got it in there pretty quick. That wasn't too long with how much mass the blade has. Man, that is that is warped like a banana. That's not what I like to see. It's like the warp that was there, it just magnified it. Also, that's kind of heavy to hold with one hand. Looks like the salt protected the blade really well though. See how clean that is? Just has a gray residue on there. I'm scared to handle this tang. I feel like I'm gonna break it off. <laughs> Cause it's like really brittle right now. Yeah, I'm gonna try to keep the tang handling to a minimum. Wow, look how clean that is. Look how clean the steel is. I bet if you just rubbed with some 600 grit on that, you'd be back to completely fresh looking metal. Isn't that incredible? Normally the whole blade would be covered in scale like this, up here where it wasn't in the salt. All right, let's get a better look down this thing. See how, oh man. Oh, it's so bad, so bad. See if you can see this. Look how much that's warped, man. It's warped real bad. Can you see it? Getting heavy. Uh, good news is it doesn't look like it's warped at all in this direction. Like when I look down at this way, the edges look nice and straight. So it's only warped in the direction that we can straighten, which is good, because if it warped in the other way, we can't straighten it. Ugh. Look at that tang, the tang's like, the stinking tang's like an inch over out of place. I don't, I might break this thing straightening this. I think I've changed my mind. I wanna go ahead and Rockwell test this. My curiosity's just going through the roof. I'm gonna go down the center of the blade. The center of the blade is the hardest area to harden just because there's all the metal surrounding it. I would expect this blade to be somewhere between 65 and 67 Rockwell um, in the center if everything hardened up perfectly. Now normally you would have to grind the scale and stuff off, but this isn't normal because there is no scale. Here we go. Let's see how hard this is without my hand on there. Okay, we're coming in at 64.5. 64.4, four. that's definitely good. We're gonna do a couple more tests going down the blade though. Okay, let's see where this test in the center of the blade comes out to. 65.2 Rockwell, very nice. I just got done Rockwell testing the blade and looks like for the most part, it came out to be 64 to 65 Rockwell, uh, kind of in the center of the blade and out towards the edge on the couple of tests I did. There is one weird little anomaly here where I was getting some little bit lower readings, but they were still like 61 to 63 Rockwell. So that's harder than we want this blade to be after it's tempered. So we're still golden on this. It's been about two or two and a half hours since we hardened the blade and it took that long for the salts to cool down, for us to lift the tank out, for dad to replace that tank with the low temperature salts and to get them all heated up and ready to go. It's time to finally get this blade in here because we don't want it outside of the, uh, we want it to get tempered as quick as possible because it's under a tremendous amount of stress right now. The salts are heated up to 222 degrees Celsius, which should be right around 431 point something degrees Fahrenheit. I'm tempering this just a couple degrees higher than I normally would a buoy or something. Normally I would do a buoy at about 425. So first we're gonna go in here just to burn out some of the condensation. We go for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Don't wanna go in there too long because it could actually overheat the blade. And then we're gonna go into the salts.
These are much lower temperature, so they should be much, much less risk involved here. Still want to be careful and cautious with them though. Going way in here. Get that whole thing in there. Very nice. The entire blade is in there, including the entire tang. I'm going to let that temper for a good hour. And then what I think I'm going to do is flip the blade around and temper it for another hour with it flipped around 180 degrees. That way, in case there's a slight temperature difference between the top and the bottom, which we did a test on and thought maybe there was like a 0.8 Rockwell difference in hardness, that should even that out to where there's almost no difference whatsoever by tempering it for one hour this way and then flipping it around and doing it another hour the other direction. I'm wrapping it up here for the day. I'm very happy we got the blade hardened. And as far as I can tell, I never heard any pings or cracks or anything. The blade is severely warped, but it's warped in a good direction, not the bad direction. So hopefully I'll be able to get it straightened out. I'm gonna babysit this for the next couple hours. I need to make sure that this thing stays on temperature and get this blade tempered properly. But other than that, I am done and very happy with how this blade's coming out. Babysit time, time to babysit the baby salts. Time to listen to an audio book. It's day 15 of working on the Griffin Sword. Check out the coloration on this blade. I babysat this last night and made sure that it tempered for that full two hours in the low temperature salts. And the coloration on this sword is incredible. I've never seen any kind of tempering colors that look quite like this. It's got that bronzy straw color that I've seen before, but it's also got this swirly spotted like speckled look that almost makes it look like a bronzy straw colored camouflage or something. It's really, really unique looking and I kind of really like it. I also went ahead and Rockwell tested the blade because I wanted to see how hard it was after tempering. I did 11 Rockwell tests and the average came out to be 60.1 Rockwell. And all the tests were very close to each other. The lowest Rockwell test I did was like 59.2 and the highest was 61.4. So the, the margin of difference was very, very similar. The first thing I need to grind on is to do a little bit of surface grinding. The blade's almost the final thickness that I want it at its thickest areas but I do need to take a couple thousandths of an inch off just so we can flatten things out and get this blade uh, all shiny back up. This session at the surface grinder, I don't want to leave an extremely coarse finish on the blade. I want it to be a little finer, so I use my diamond dressing tool on the surface grinder wheel. That looks really not flat, doesn't it? That's just because I, I put a finer finish on it with the round wheel. The blades being hardened makes the metal move a lot differently. If I surface grind any of the blade hanging over the table, it wants to suck the material up and do all sorts of strange things. Before the blade was hardened, I could run the surface grinder wheel over the ends of the table and it didn't cause too much of an issue, but now I have to be much more careful, otherwise it's going to make the blade suck up and cut deep grooves into the blade from the wheel, pulling it in in the heat. I just finished surface grinding on the blade. That was challenging and took about 10 times longer than I was expecting. I only removed small amounts of material. I dressed the surface grinder wheel so it would leave a little bit more of a fine finish. And something about this blade being heat treated and severely warped was making it extra difficult to surface grind. I noticed that if I went over where these magnets in on the surface grinder magnet that it would suck the metal up and it was doing all sorts of weird things, leaving some deep grooves in there. I got everything looking really good or as best as I can get it. And my blade came out to be right at a quarter inch thick. It's exactly 250 thousandths. It'll end up losing a few more thousandths by the end, but that's pretty much what I was shooting for. So I'm pretty happy about that. I'm calling it here for the day. I had a bunch of YouTube stuff that I did off camera that ended up eating up a lot of time. Plus this took about 10 times longer than I was expecting to surface grind. Hopefully tomorrow I can continue moving on. At some point I have to face this crazy, crazy curve to the blade. Look how crooked that is. It is like whoop. It is day 16 of working on the Griffin Sword and today I want to get this blade profiled. It's currently just roughed in. I want to get it much closer to the final profile. I've got some material to remove from the uh, profile of the blade this way and I also want to get this blade straightened. Right now this thing is quite the banana. I mean just look down that. This is horribly horribly crooked and I really want to get it straightened. The reason I want to go ahead and profile the blade first is because 
that little bit of grinding that I do on the edge might create a little bit of stress, might affect the blade being straight. So I'm gonna go ahead and get that grinding done and then straighten the blade. Getting lighter. Whoa, still pretty heavy, but getting lighter. And it'll reach around those corners right now. That is so curvy, especially if you count the tang. <laughs> Look how high that tang is if I hold it. That's not even holding it flat on the tip of the blade. That's just holding it flat on the middle of the blade. <laughs> 550 thousandths of an inch, so it's over a half inch out between the center of the blade and the end of the tang. <laughs> I really hope I can get this straight. That feels really good on a cold, on a cold morning. Mm. Hey, stand right there. <laughs> I've had worse on me. I used to change your diapers. Oh, I had a thought. Uh oh. Yesterday, even though this is pretty symmetrical, in order to keep it even more symmetrical, I'm going to use this pattern as if it were a half pattern. I'm going to use one side, flip it over, and use the other side. For your information, this may involve a lot of me moving things over by like two thousandths of an inch and checking and contemplating and second guessing myself a hundred million times. FYI, I really want to clear the workbench off and spin this really hard. <laughs> what do you want, Padre? Um, I did a left and right twist on this little wire. A little longer than a few minutes later. We're leaving it a good, I don't know, three sixteenths thicker out here at the tip which I'm, I think I'm fine with because I kind of like the way it looks already. All right, let's scribe it up. Quick grip, quick grip, quick grip, quick grip. You can use quick grips as slow grips. They just take special technique, okay? So this is how you use a quick grip the way you're intended to make it quick. Boop. Quick, okay? Now, if you want to turn this quick grip into a mock slow grip, now it won't be like the name brand slow grip, what you can do is treat it the same as you would a slow grip. And even though it's called a quick grip, you can basically get the same results that you would get out of the slow grip. See this? Pay special attention, this is how you do it. If you don't have a slow grip on hand and you wanna kind of cheat your way there with a quick grip. <laughs> Getting closer. You wanna slow down a little bit as you get closer there, okay? Just about to make contact, right, well, I don't want to put it there, but <laughs> right there. Ooh, that blade is warped. <laughs> okay. A little quick grip this one. And now you know how to use your quick grip like a slow grip in case you don't have a slow grip on hand. <coughs> I feel like Gandalf when he's like coughing. Ow. Poke. I poked myself today to see if my scribe was still sharp. It poked me all the way and it left a really good mark. <laughs> Unclamp. Slow grip. No, I ain't got time for that. We're doing quick grips. <laughs> <coughs> the reason I decided to flip the pattern over is because there's probably some slight irregularities from one side of the pattern to the other. By flipping the pattern over, any irregularities that we have on one side versus the other are gonna be gone. Now, if there's some irregularities on one side, at least when we flip it over, those same irregularities will be on this side too, so it'll be symmetrical. Wait. Which way was it now? I cannot see. There's no light on this side of the, on this side of the world. <laughs> I'm about to flip it over this way. Now I can see a little bit. I mean, it's pretty good to me, I think. Really doesn't look like I should be able to get my scribe on there, but I think this pattern has a slight bevel on it and I'm getting this, <laughs> putting the scribe in that little bevel. We're gonna have to fake the tip in a little bit. 
can check it with paper. I'll show you that later. I love having this thicker full pattern. Also, it happens to be made out of 52100. <laughs> a little bit of a waste, could have been mild steel, but I didn't actually have any mild steel that wide and that thin, so this being made out of 52100, you could technically harden this and turn it into like a super thin, uh, super thin flexible sword. Like, uh, oh, I've seen some Jackie Chan movies where they're using some kind of Chinese swords that are super thin and there's like a couple of them layered next to each other that go into the scabbard together. I forget what they're called, but you, you could turn this into a, a European like broadsword version of those that have this super, super thin flexible blade. Once you ground the edge down on this thing, I mean, it would just be, it'd be so flexible. It's already really flexible. <laughs> okay. Inspection. Inspection. No, not there, but enough to see a scribe line. I like that. Okay, I think we're pretty much there. I like these scribe lines, it looks good. I'm keeping the blade as wide as I possibly can back here. I went ahead and made the blade a little wider out towards the tip than what my sketch is in my template, just to give me a little wiggle room and I think it actually looks nice and we have the material, so I'm gonna go ahead and leave it there. Yeah, I'll probably do a little 36 grit, but mostly 120 on this profiling. This thing is so, so, so incredibly well designed and lightweight. <laughs> oh. oh, I've been using this thing for quite a while now and it still is just so rewarding when I hold that, change this, click that. Here we go! I gotta make sure the belt is off of this grinder when I'm over here. The belt was there, it's getting away. I finished grinding the profile of the blade down to my scribe line with a 120 grit belt. I do need to check the tip of the blade though because I'm leaving it slightly wider than my sketch and my pattern was, I need to make sure that the tip is all nice and symmetrical. So the way you can do that is just by laying the tip of the blade down on a piece of paper, and then I can trace around it with a pencil. Now I can take the sword off, flip it over, and if everything's symmetrical, it should match up to the pencil lines almost perfectly. If something's a little off, I should be able to see a weird little spot and make an adjustment at the grinder. Looks pretty good. It looks like the very tip though is going over my line on this side a little bit. So what I need to do is just grind a little bit of material off this side to make that more symmetrical. Try that on for size. I ground that little bit off the tip and then we just do the same thing again, check it. This time I've got the blade laying across the table, so hopefully it's not as hard to hold it down nicely. For this to be accurate, you need your pencil line to be very close to the blade. Okay, pick it up, blow it off, flip it over, and then line it all back up. Getting it lined back up, that's kind of the tricky part, especially with a big blade like this. If you look at the line right here, you can see a little bit of that paper showing on the other side of the line. So there's a little bit of a low spot right here. If you look over here on this side, the blade is slightly on the line. So that means this side has just a little bit of a high spot. I need to remove a couple thousandths of an inch right through here. So what I'll do is I'll just take my marker, give myself a little range where I need to remove that material and then go over to the grinder and just remove a tiny bit of material right there and then I can come back and do a fresh paper test. Sometimes I'll get the blade tip symmetrical after one or two tries, and sometimes it's really fought me and it takes like 15, 20 tries before I'll finally get the uh, tip of the blade nice and symmetrical. I've got it all lined up as carefully as I can and I can see just a little bit of the paper between the blade and the line right here on this side. And when I look over here on this side, I'm seeing the exact same thing. It looks like it's nice and even on both sides. It looks like the tip is nice and centered. I think we're done profiling this blade now. Took me four tries on the paper. Went back to the grinder like three or four times. 
made some very minor adjustments at the tip, and I'm happy with that. The next thing I need to work on is straightening this blade. This blade being warped is causing so many, so many things to be more difficult. Time to get it straightened, and I am not looking forward to this. I hope I can get it straight without uh, breaking the blade and without spending too, too many hours on it. I mean, the table's pretty flat, as you can see by putting this on there that way. Put it on here this way. Hold it all the way up by the end of the very tang. And it's not the table, because when I flip it over this way. <laughs> uh, definitely the most warped out of the three swords I've made. Can we fast forward to the part where it's perfectly straight and skip the uh, whatever happens in between? I was about ready to cry, I feel like, before. Because oh, yeah. I felt like it was on the verge of breaking. Let's just start out in the middle. We're gonna need to get the torch set up. We're gonna need lots of water to spray and pour. Ugh. 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 <laughs> How much you give me to drink this? Probably get sick and die from like little organisms crawling around in it. Okay, hopefully it doesn't fight me. And hopefully I don't overheat the edge to a blue color and ruin the the heat treatment. Oh, that would be pretty devastating at this point. I've got the blade clamped up in the vise. I've got a torch here with uh, my medium sized welding tip. I've got water on hand. What we're gonna be doing is heating up this blade. I'm gonna try to heat it up to kind of a straw color. Probably don't wanna go past like a purple color because I've realized that can affect the etch a little bit if you heat it up to like a blue color. I also don't want to get any purple or blue in the edge of the blade because that'll be tempering the edge at a higher temperature than what we did the rest of the blade at. So we're going to be shooting for a straw to bronze color. I'm going to work on this little six inch section here first. Heat the blade up, pull it over until you're about ready to cry and think you're going to break it. Hold it in place and cool it off with water. And then sometimes it goes really smooth and sometimes it'll fight you and you'll have to redo it and keep working it like 150 times. So we'll see what kind of day today is. I'm not feeling good about it because of the amount of warpage. There's just so much, but let's get this thing fired up. Now, when you're doing this on your blades, you always wanna start with the side that you're not gonna focus on. The reason being, you're gonna get tons of condensation and that condensation will affect the heat coloring. So I'm gonna focus all my attention on this side. So I wanna start on the opposite side and just kind of do the preheating on that side because all that condensation will like heat up and it'll make all sorts of nasty brown mess. Just gonna go enough to get rid of all the condensation and then we can focus on the main side here. Okay, I'm really just gonna focus in the middle of the blade. Just wanna get this up to a straw color I think we're starting to get some coloring going on there. Very, very light straw color. Okay, here we go for our first straightening. Don't grab it right here, it's very hot. So I'm gonna pull the blade way over and then we're gonna cool it off. I normally like to cool it off enough to where I don't hear the water spittling and spattling anymore. And then we can let go of the blade, take it out of the, the vise and the, oh wow. Oh yeah, baby. Woo! Oh, that did so much right there. That little section, that little section looks completely straight to me. That looks good. That looks really good. We're gonna be golden if I can get the whole thing to go that well. I move the blade over. I've got the section we just did pretty much in the vise here. A little bit of it's hanging out to overlap the, uh, the area. Now I'm gonna work the next six inch section.
Real quick, learning new skills for making knives can take a lot of time. So I made online courses to help you learn faster and save money. I'll teach you everything I know step by step and show you how to make awesome knives. Makers who've taken my online courses are years ahead and save an average of $30,000 compared to in-person classes. If you want to make better knives and earn more money from them, you can get all my courses for just $3.85 a year. So click the link in the description today and get access to every course I've ever made. Oh yeah. Definitely doing things. Now something that needs to be said about this, you can go too far with this. I've done this several times where I went too far before and then I tried to go back, went too far the other way, tried to go back the other way, went too far and keep just fighting it side to side and side to side to side and over and over and over and over before I hit that perfect sweet spot right in the middle. So that was the second section. Got it looking really good. I'm gonna continue doing this now, working little six inch sections at a time working my way down the blade. I need to work the uh, tip section too. And once I go over the entire blade, then I'm gonna take a look at it, analyze, see what I need to do, go back in and do it again. In some places, I'll need to go further. So in that case, you just sand the coloring off the blade and do it again. Sometimes it takes right away. Sometimes you have to do it four, five, six, ten times before it'll finally like stay in place where you want it. Straightening the blade went extremely smoothly. It only took me five or six times at the vise with the torch to get the entire blade straightened. The tang, however, did not want to be straightened. I spent about an hour straightening the blade and then about four hours working the tang over and over and over and over. It just wasn't straightening. It wasn't staying in place like the blade did. At one point, I was pulling the blade over so far that I was nearly in tears because I was almost certain that the tang was going to break off at any point. The tang didn't break off though and pulling the blade over so far to where I thought it was going to break off actually got it to straighten out. In fact, it went so far that it went beyond straight to being warped to the other side. It's not a big deal if you accidentally go too far. Normally you can get it to move back. Getting whatever you're trying to straighten to move in the first place can sometimes be the challenge though. It goes really smoothly sometimes and then just puts up an incredible fight other times. Overall, straightening the blade and tang ended up taking me about five hours. Well, that did it. Now it's too far the other way. I finally got the blade straightened. The blade itself wasn't too big of a deal. I straightened everything up until this last inch of the blade in, I don't know, like an hour. And then I spent a half a day working on this last inch and the tang. It would not straighten up. I kept heating it up, kept pulling it over, over and over and over and over and over again, and it just wouldn't get straight. It was getting close. The end of the tang was probably like a sixteenth of an inch out of whack with the blade, but it just wouldn't go. Finally, I heated the tang up extra hot. It's okay if the tang gets a, a, a blue color in it. It's gonna all end up tempered back to a blue color anyway to make it more like a spring. So I was okay with that on the tang. But anyway, I heated it up extra hot, pulling it over while I was heating it up, and then cooled it down with water, and that time it moved. It moved so far that it was actually out of whack the other way a little bit, but once I had it there, I had it moving, it was easy to get it back. Now when I lay it on the granite surface, we can see how flat it is. So if I lay the blade on here, tip's not all up in the air or anything anymore. Slide it down here a little bit. Tang is sitting nice and flat. Nice and nice and nice and flat. Flip it over, should be the same story. Nice and flat across there, and the tang isn't sticking up either. If the tang was sticking up a little bit, it'd make a sound like this. When I push down on it, you would hear it like banging up against the granite. But when it's nice and flat, it just makes nice quiet thuds. Very nice and flat. The blade straightened so nicely. It was amazing how nice and easy the blade straightened. But man, that tang, the tang was so crooked too. It was just way out of whack. Anyway, it is the end of the day, and I am done fighting this for the day. I'm quite frankly exhausted. I, I don't know how many dozens of times I went back to this thing trying to get that tang straightened. <clears throat> I am signing off for today. Day 16 of working on the Griffin Sword. Adios. 
It's day 19 of working on the Griffin sword. I just spent two days off camera working on how I'm gonna do the fuller on this sword. Doing some practice, trying to figure out exactly how I'm gonna get this fuller ground into the blade before I do it on the real thing. Why do I wanna practice? Because I don't wanna accidentally mess up and ruin the way I want the fuller to come out on the real thing. Once you grind it in there, it's pretty much in there permanently. So I've got this piece here. This was our template for the blade. I went ahead and did a practice fuller on this. I'd like to point out how this is a prime example of how grinding can make your, uh, make your metal warp. See how much that curved just from grinding in that fuller and grinding in those bevels. This thing is so curvy. The good thing about an actual sword blade though, is all that stress that's, that's happening on one side of the blade from grinding will be counteracted by the other side. This is just a template, it's half the thickness of the sword, so it doesn't have that, that grinding on the other side to counteract it, and it gives you a real good visual indicator of how much grinding alone can warp your blade. I've also got this piece that I did uh, two more fuller practices on, just a piece of 1084. I've got the fuller right here, and another one on this side. Once again, you can see what, uh, what grinding does to your metal there. This thing's curvier than a dog leg. I think I've got it mostly figured out, but there's one more test that I wanna run before we actually do it on the real blade, and that is to test the tang area. Because the way I've designed this sword, the fuller is gonna go just into the tang ever so slightly, a little bit right here at the base of the blade. And I wanna make sure that that's gonna be strong enough. So to simulate that, I've ground a fuller into this piece that's about as wide as the tang will be. I'm gonna heat treat it, temper it, and then we're gonna bend it and see how hard it is to bend and break. I wanna make sure that this seems strong enough since that's what I'm planning on doing on the real thing. Let's go ahead and harden and temper this tang test piece and then I'll put it in a vise and we'll bend it and see how much force it takes to break it off and I'll make my decision on whether or not this is gonna be strong enough or if I have to change directions on it. Coffee break. Right now. I'm gonna turn the vent fan on. I got our test piece nice and hardened. I also cleaned it up at the grinder, got rid of all the scale from hardening it so I could see the tempering colors. Next, I'm gonna go ahead and temper it with the torch, the same as the temper on the tang of the sword will be. I'm gonna be drawing it back to kind of a, a blue slash gray color, which is gonna leave the tang softer than the cutting edge of the blade and more spring-like. So we're gonna do the exact same temper on this test piece. Starting to get hot, getting some straw colors. It's gonna go from straw to kind of a bronze to kind of a purple to a blue to a little bit of a gray. Gonna take more heat to heat up this area because it's a big thick flat bar versus the hollow ground area. There's some blue. I'm not worried about this little tiny end bit here that the uh, vice grips are on. Just gonna go a little bit more, just beyond the blue, just a little bit gray, or kind of a light blue. That'll leave this tempered pretty much like a spring. It's still hard, but not hard enough to be a, a good blade, but we don't need the tang to be a good blade. We actually need the tang to be really tough and resilient. I'm gonna cool this off, and then we'll be able to do the uh, bend stress test and see how strong this ground out fuller area is. I've situated our test piece so that just a tiny, tiny bit of that fuller is sticking up above the vice jaws. That's because on the real sword, the way I'm planning on doing it, that fuller will only go into the tang a very little bit. So I want this test to be very similar to the sword test. I'm gonna clamp it really tightly with these pieces of wooden here to keep from adding some tremendous stress points because on the real sword, you're not gonna have a really nasty, uh, nasty coarse jaw there when it comes to stress. I'm gonna clamp this up nice and tight, and we're gonna see how strong that tang is. Before I do the test on this piece, I wanna say that 
it's absolutely gonna break off right there where the fuller is. That's without question. What I'm really wanting to test is how much force that really takes. Because that area with the fuller is quite a bit thinner than the rest of it, I wanna make sure that it's gonna be strong enough for the sword. And I'm just gonna have to gauge that by how much pressure it takes uh, to bend this over and break it off. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to go here. Safety glass is on. Might need a longer bar, I'm not sure. I don't want to hurt myself with this. I feel like I'm gonna hurt myself. Okay, now we have more leverage. Let's try again. How loud is that gonna be? Ugh. Did it break? Oh, yep, it broke. <laughs> um, that took quite a bit of force, really. That took quite a bit of force to break off. Wow, that grain structure looks excellent. That took a lot of force, but I still feel undecided. I don't know if that helped at all. Can I redesign the sword, particularly here? Yes, ideas coming right. into my brain. Think I can make it so I feel better about the tang. Hey, that rhymed. So after doing this test, I think the way I wanted to grind the fuller in and have it disappear into the tang is probably gonna be strong enough, but I was looking at what I could do to the sword to make it even stronger, the transition from fuller and blade and tang. So this is how I was originally gonna have it. The guard was gonna fit right up to this line and the fuller was gonna disappear underneath the guard. I've seen a lot of traditional swords where this is exactly how they'll have it. They'll have that fuller just kind of disappear onto the tang, maybe have it taper back like an inch or so. But I think what I want to do to make it extra strong right there is move my guard up a little bit, have the guard fit up to right here, and then leave some extra material right here and right here, and then have that fuller disappear right here. That way the weak point of the fuller material being ground away isn't meeting up with the narrow part of the tang. We've got this extra wide right here. There'll be some extra beefy material. The fuller will stop right there, disappearing underneath the guard, leaving that whole transition uh, just a little bit stronger. I think this is strong enough, but because I left the sword a little extra long, we have enough material to work with that I can move that forward and make it even more strong right here. I think after more than two days of time doing experiments with all these fullers, getting the depth, different size wheels and all this stuff, I think I'm finally ready to do the real thing on the real sword. Before I start grinding though, what do we need? We need some good layout to follow like always. So I'm gonna spray this blade with some dicum layout fluid just so I can see those scribe lines extra well. And even if the dicum wears off and gets rubbed off during the grinding process, I'll still have the scribe lines on the blade. They'll just stand out a little bit better here, at least at the beginning. Man, this thing's big. So on my sketch, the fuller at its widest is 870 thousandths of an inch wide. But I wanna try to keep this webbing, this, this thin area here in the middle of the fuller, that's what I'm gonna call the webbing. I'm gonna try to keep that slightly thicker. So I'm doing a couple of different things to achieve that. One thing is I'm gonna make the fuller slightly narrower. I'm gonna make it 800 thousandths wide. So we're just talking about a little over a 16th of an inch less than what the sketch is. And who knows, I might make some little mistakes grinding and it might end up back to that width anyway, but at least it won't be over that width if I happen to make some mistakes because I started out at that width. Another thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a two and a quarter inch wheel. We'd well, be like, Kyle, you don't have a two and a quarter inch wheel. And you'd be right, I don't have. I have two inch and then it jumps all the way to three inch. I would like to have some two and a quarter, maybe two and a half would probably be perfect, two and a half for this. So how am I gonna do a two and a quarter inch wheel if I don't have one? Well, I put about 100 layers of duct tape around my two inch wheel, and I think that'll artificially get me to two and a quarter. I measured it with my things, and it's two and a quarter. I think it'll work. Having a larger wheel will make it so this center webbing is thicker because that wheel will have a larger diameter, and it won't be grinding as deep into the sword by the time I get to the, uh, the width I want on the fuller. Does that make sense? Good. So now we know we want the fuller at 800 thousandths of an inch wide at the base of the sword here. We're already at the center, so all I need to do is zero this out. 
out. And then I can raise or lower this by 400,000. I'm gonna lower it just because things are more stable when you're closer to the uh, the table instead of up higher where the blade can flop around more. So we're gonna go one, two, three, four hundred thousandths of an inch. Lock that in place. I'm just gonna make a little line here. We'll flip it over and do it on the, the other side and then confirm that we have the right number going on with our calipers. Measure those. Yep, they seem, it looks like they're pretty much, pretty much right around eight hundred thousandths of an inch. So we're good there. I'm gonna make those lines deeper now and do them on both sides of the blade. The next thing I need to figure out is where the fuller is gonna end on the blade. So I'm gonna use my sketch for reference. Got it hanging right here. I believe it's somewhere around like 26 and a half inches or so, 26, 26 and a quarter. I'm gonna call it 26 and a half, even though it's closer to 26 and a, and a quarter there, just cause I feel like it. Never mind, I changed my mind. I'm gonna go to 26 and a quarter. Right there. Now I need to find the center of the blade right here at that 26 and a quarter inch mark. The entire blade's tapered, so that would change throughout the blade. That's why I needed to figure out where the fuller's gonna end and find the center there. It is one inch, 460 thousandths of an inch wide there. One, two, three, four, five. One, two and 30. Should be the center. Yes, very good. I want a more defined line for where the fuller is gonna end. So I need to get a file guide on here so we can have a nice solid line that lines up perfectly on both sides of the blade. So we don't want the fuller to end at a different spot on one side of the blade than the other. It'd be all offset. We want the fuller to end on both sides at the same place. Now that I know the center, I can just, even though this is tapered, I can line that up with the center on both sides. Yep, just like that. Okay, right there. Now we can give ourselves a good solid scribe line across here. Nice deep one. Since we have the file guide on there, to get it parallel on the other side, all we gotta do is flip it over. And we now have parallel lines ending at the same position. If I accidentally grind over this line a little bit, it won't be too much work to just move it down a little bit and redo it so it's not the end of the world. I'll probably need some parallel lines on the other end of the blade too, but probably not until I get into that actual grinding. So I'm not gonna worry about those right now. Two seconds later, he starts doing parallel lines on the other end. No, no, actually, I changed my mind and I think I'd rather add some parallel lines at that end right now, even though they'll get ground off before the apex of the predator has been uh, uh, dealt with. And then, uh, uh... So here's where things really start to get tricky and I have to make a decision. At the base of the blade, back here where the tang is, you can just mark out your lines for how wide you want that fuller and, that, and the fuller is gonna end up being that wide. But down here on the other end, it's not so simple. Because these edge bevels are gonna be ground in all the way to where they meet up in the middle, they're gonna make this fuller taper and getting the proper amount of taper on this fuller is gonna be key. So on my test sample here on the small end of the fuller, I made the fuller layout be 250 thousandths narrower than the wide end back here. But this one's too big. On this one that's getting closer, I made it 350 thousandths narrower than the large end. But it's still a little bigger than I want. So I think on our sword, what I'm gonna do is go for 450 thousandths narrower on the small end of the fuller. Now, narrow, narrower is hard for me to say apparently. 450 thousandths narrower, na narrower, narrower. The more I say it, the worse it gets. So for the sword, we're gonna go 450 thousandths narrow, narrow, narrower, narrower. It's, I, I, I'm losing the word. <laughs> On the sword, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna bump it up to 450 thousandths skinnier here at the smallest area of the fuller compared to the widest area back here. There, <laughs> I conquered my word by just skipping it. Little test line, flip it over. Then we're gonna confirm with calipers. It's coming in at 450 thousandths. 450. That's not 450 less than 800. 
450 less than 800 is 350. Oh, oh, yeah, we want, we want the, we want the fuller to be 450 thousandths narrower than the widest portion. So I'd use the wrong number. 800 minus 450, take that number and divide it by two. So 350 divided by two is the number we're looking for here. Okay, 350 divided by two. That's why we double check, confirm with calipers to make sure that uh, things look right. That's not gonna get confusing at all, having double layout lines there. There we go. That's actually a lot different size-wise. So this number should be 350. Yep. I'm gonna call that 350 thousandths wide right there. That looks good. Now all I need to do is connect the layout lines from this end to this end, and we'll have our layout for the fuller. The straightest thing I think I have in the shop is actually this strip of 52100. I've been using this for my practice pieces, looking down it many, many times, it seems nice and straight, so I'm gonna use this to connect these lines together, along with a couple little machinist clamps to hold it in place. And these scribe lines I'm about to make, I'm gonna make them in really, really deep. That way, in case I wear off the dicum during this long grinding process, I'll still have those deep lines that I should be able to see even with no dicum there. I'm gonna go beyond the fuller as well, just so it runs out there. Could come in handy, you never know. Make multiple passes. I'm applying a lot of pressure on the scribe too. And here it is, the layout is done on the Griffin sword for the fuller. I think it looks really good. It looks kind of skinny down here, but that's really what we need. Once I grind this in, if I feel like it's too skinny, like it's going against my instinct or something, we can widen it back out. That's the nice thing about doing this fuller. It's better to start off with it being a little bit more narrow because you can always widen it back out. But if you start off too wide, you can't put the metal back on. Let's head over to the grinder and start grinding this. It's gonna be a lot of really meticulous, intensive grinding. So I gotta hold this big old sword and at some points I'll be having the, uh, the weight of the blade hanging way out over here and way out over here as I'm sitting there grinding. So it's gonna be a challenge for sure. Probably the biggest challenging fuller I've ever done in my life, actually. Actually. I'm pretty terrified to actually grind on the fuller. One little mistake or one muscle twitch could spell catastrophic disaster for this sword. I keep going up to the grinder, do a little jig, I'm just avoiding grinding this fuller at this point. The initial grinding is actually pretty difficult because you don't have any kind of a track. Once you start getting that fuller ground in deeper and deeper, you begin to form basically a railroad track for yourself. Something else that's becoming obvious right away is that I'm using a larger wheel than I've ever used on a fuller before. And because of that, the track isn't as deep and defined as you would have with a smaller wheel. With a smaller wheel, you'd have an aggressive track that keeps your wheel in the track very easily. But the larger your wheel is, the less defined that track is and the easier it is to make a mistake or come out of the track as you're grinding. I'm gonna keep working my way to the ends, just taking my time as much as possible. As I grind more and more on this blade, it's getting heavier and heavier too, either on my right hand or my left hand. Another challenging part of this is that I need to hold the wheel parallel to my layout lines. If I start to let the blade droop down or raise it up too high, then all of a sudden my wheel will be kind of crooked in relation to the fuller and it'll grind a wider groove and I might grind over my scribe lines. You'll see me hunched over quite a bit grinding blades normally, but this is much worse. So I have to really get over the blade to be able to look at it from an angle to where I can see behind the blade to be able to make sure that I'm grinding right up close to my scribe line. Another issue I ran into was light. Normally I can have the light coming straight down on the blade, but in this case, I actually need the light to almost be behind the blade a little bit so I can see the scribe line and there's not a horrible shadow where the grinding wheel is hitting the blade. You may notice I'm wearing an awesome t-shirt. This is the Griffin t-shirt in blood red. It is a Griffin holding the Griffin sword that I'm creating right now. If you want to get one just like this, then check out the link in the description. These shirts look awesome and the printing is done right here in Springfield, Missouri and is very high quality. Get yourself or somebody you know one right now. That's not going well. That's so bouncy and stuff. And I don't, it doesn't look very good so far. And I already went over the line right here. 
I mean, that makes that means I got to make the entire fuller wider on both sides, on both sides of the sword and on both sides of the, each side. Just because of that right there. Back when I did the layout for the fuller, I decided to make the fuller just a little bit narrower than my sketch. I was doing that to give myself wiggle room in case I went over the line a little bit. I do have a tiny bit of wiggle room to where I could widen out the fuller just a little bit to hopefully cover up this mistake. But I need to be extremely careful because if I make a mistake and go over the line a little bit too far, I won't be able to cover it up by making the fuller wide enough because it'll just get out of hand and ridiculously wide at some point. I am done. I am done working on that for today. That was so much hollow grinding. I got this thing rough ground in using three different size wheels, two and a quarter, one, like five eighths or something down here. It's rough ground in, I am done. I still have more fine grinding to do, a whole lot more fine grinding to do, but my wrists and my arm, whoop, that's hot. Cannot handle that anymore. I will see you in the next video. May the forge be with you. Bye-bye!